We have a lot of news to talk about today, but let's start with what I think is the most exciting thing, which is GPU prices dropping, at least on certain models. Let's talk about it a little bit. So with NVIDIA launching the super series of cards, suddenly the price to performance calculations have completely changed in the uh, 600 to $1,000 price points, especially in the 600 to $800 price point, where the 4070 super is probably offering the best price to performance of the lineup, but then the 4070 Ti Super brought a 16 gigabyte VRAM NVIDIA GPU to the $800 price point. The $800 price point is where AMD's 7900 XT used to be hanging out, where it was competing with the 4070 Ti, which wasn't super. Uh, and only had 12 gigabytes of VRAM. So with the stronger competitor from NVIDIA at the $800 price point, you need some downward price pressure on the AMD product. Um, and, but then uh, again, the 4070 Ti, which is now discontinued, but is still in stock, also needed its price shifted down. And we've been seeing models uh, dropping to 699. We've also seen the 4070 non-super drop to as low as 519 recently. So with all of that going on, AMD's had to adjust the pricing of the 7900 XT. Now we haven't had any official wor a word of like an official, uh, you know, MSRP change or anything like that, but um, it has been in stock on Amazon for as low as 669.99. Now I've been posting these on my community page, which is where I post a lot of price drops that I notice on, on PC hardware. It's kind of a win-win for me because I research it anyway, just as part of my news news videos. And then if I post them uh, for you guys, and if they are available at places where I have an affiliate link, yeah, I get a cut of that. It's kind of a win-win. Anyway, uh, so I've been posting these. I posted this one two days ago, and then it went out of stock after a few hours, but it was in stock again this morning. No guarantees on if it's still in stock when you watch this video, but it was in, but um, when I posted it two days ago, it had actually already been available a day before that, but had gone out of stock. So what I'm saying is this has been coming in and out of stock over the last several days at this price point. Now to hit that price point, it's applying a coupon code. Yes, I say coupon, not coupon. That's just the way I was raised, man. M Mama raised me right. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, the 699 price point has been available places like Newegg as well. But additionally, this is not the only crazy low price I've seen. Uh, I've seen the Power Color Hellhound 7700 XT drop to 356.99 on Newegg. And remember, this card has a 449.99 uh, MSRP. So that's almost $100 below MSRP. Now this one sold out very quickly and I have not seen it come back in stock, but there was another power color model, the Fighter, uh, at 352.74, so even slightly lower than that. This one also was available at that price about two days ago, but then, um, uh, but then sold out as well. But again, just because they're sold out right now, as we've been seeing, a lot of times when a low price has been reached, it hits that again. So it's just really good to see price movement on these products. And again, if you check out my community page, I tend to monitor these types of price drops um, as, as, uh, as I notice them. So anyway, I think that's pretty exciting, but also please tell me this is relatable. You keep getting new gadgets. They all come with their own little USB charger blocks. You keep plugging them all into your power strip. You have this giant mess of cords and power bricks. And finally you get one more device. You need to plug it in. There's no room and your head explodes with frustration. And today's sponsor, Ugreen has solved this problem for me with their Nexode Pro series of chargers. They have a 160 watt USB-C charger with four ports. And this thing is awesome. It's a GAN charger. That means that it's much more energy efficient and less heat and size, which is absolutely awesome. And it delivers so much power so quickly. This thing can charge a MacBook Pro 16 inch from 0% to 50% in just 27 minutes. And I can also be charging and to on top of the laptop, I could toss in a Steam Deck. I could top, uh, pop in my, my work iPad. I could put in my phone, which is also capable of super fast charging. And speaking of which, not every 
charger is compatible with Samsung's new fast charging to 45 watt fast charging 2.0. This one is. Now, if a 100 watt three port charger is more what you're looking for, they have that co covered as well. And they have several other uh, chargers in the Nexode Pro lineup. Overall, I cannot recommend these enough. These are absolutely fantastic, energy efficient devices that have both simplified my life, made everything look a lot nicer, sleek design, and they're more energy efficient, which is good for the environment too. Please check out the link in the pinned comment and or video description to check these out for yourself. And a huge thank you to you, Green, for sponsoring today's video. Now, there's some less exciting news about GPU pricing, which is just that in general, the 4080 Super, which was only exciting because of its price cut, because it, it's effectively the same exact performance as the 4080 within 3%. So uh, it's only thing it had going for it was the $200 price cut to its MSRP. Uh, we are seeing that its stock is running low, the MSRP cards are gone, and I'm just hoping that those start coming back in stock. That would be really nice. Uh, again, everywhere you check, it's like, well, uh, let me know if they come back back, back uh, available. Uh, the lowest price models available now are close to the uh, prices that 4080 non-supers were selling for before the 4080 Super launched, which was around 1150 so that's unfortunate. I'm hoping that this uh, improves. By the way, uh, all my sources that I'm, I'm using today will be linked in my video description uh, as usual. Anyway, in other uh, exciting news, uh, FSR 3 continues to be available in more games, uh, specifically Starfield. A lot of people had anticipated FSR 3 to be launched alongside Starfield, but it wasn't. Uh, instead, it just had FSR 2 upscaling, no frame generation, and then we got FSR 3 a month later in some less desirable games, uh, you know, less people playing Immortals of Avium and Forspoken than were playing Starfield. So people were a little confused about that, but now we've got a second wave of FSR 3 games. Uh, those initial games that came with it didn't have good variable refresh rate support, so clearly FSR 3 was kind of unfinished. Uh, when it launched at that point, and now it's kind of more complete at least, has better variable refresh rate support, seems to work better. Now it's open source, it's expanding to a lot more games, and again, Starfield has it. Although officially it is only in the um, the beta branch on Steam right now. So on Steam, uh, if you cl right click on your game and you, and you look at its properties, you can opt into the beta version of the game. And if you do that, uh, you'll be then, uh, it'll download the beta version of Starfield and you will have options uh, to add in uh, upscaling FSR 3 and then switch on frame generation once you kick that on. Now it does seem to only be available uh, when you're using FSR 3 pathway rather than the DLSS pathway, uh, which does seem to be the case with all the FSR 3 implementations we've seen. However, certain mods have allowed you to use DLSS upscaling with FSR 3 frame generation if you have an RTX, uh, you know, NVIDIA GPU, uh, which is, um, arguably a better case scenario for people who have DLSS, because DLSS upscaling generally has a uh, better image quality than FSR upscaling, so it would be nice to be able to mix and match the frame generation with the upscaling. As the mods have allowed, this uh, appears to be another case where we have to have FSR 3 enabled, uh, upscaling enabled in order to kick on the frame generation. Although you could run FSR 3 at native resolution uh, rather than use upscaling um, if you did want to just use frame generation without upscaling. Now, this does expand the full game integration list uh, to 12 games. We now have Forspoken, Immortals of Avium, those were our initial two on September 29th, followed shortly, uh, well, sh followed months later by Avatar, uh, on December 7th, and then uh, a week later by Like a Dragon Gaiden. And then we've now been getting very frequent updates to games with FSR 3. So it's seeming like the floodgates have finally opened. It was a very slow launch, but it is expanding rapidly now uh, to Motor Clubs, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, and Warzone, Farming Simulator, Talos Principle 2, Estensel, I may have mispronounced that one, Mortal Online 2, Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, and now the Starfield beta. So hopefully we'll keep this rolling because this is good for both AMD users and Nvidia users. Any card that's not a 40 series 
uh, it needs to get frame generation from something other than DLSS 3, right? So um, nice to see the expansion of FSR 3, but with the expansion of frame generation technologies uh, like FSR 3, as well as AMD's own driver level frame generation with AFMF that I've talked about in other videos, uh, becomes uh, the, the metric of frame rate becomes less meaningful, or at least not maybe less meaningful, but it doesn't mean the same thing it used to, right? Because as you increase frame rate, um, you know, usually your uh, your latency would decrease. So the game would become more responsive as you increased the frame rate. So we associate the idea of a high frame rate number. Like if I think of 120 frames per second, I think of a game that feels incredibly responsive in addition to looking very smooth on the screen. So remember that with frame generation technologies, those are now disconnected. You're getting uh, more smooth motion on the screen, but you're not getting that increased responsiveness. And in fact, it actually slightly decreases the responsiveness from the base frame rate. So we start to see that disconnect. And that means that measuring latency is now more important than ever. And actually today, uh, Gamers Nexus has a really interesting video that is a deep dive uh, discussion with one of, um, I think it's from uh, NVIDIA's uh, engineers, um, uh, talking about the latency pipeline. Now, even if you're not interested in um, you know, NVIDIA specifically, it's a very fascinating look at what latency actually like is. Where does this come from? How does it work? Um, and this graph is a great breakdown of the main idea, but again, you could watch the full like 29 minute video for a lot more information. But you get a latency from a lot of things. Your peripherals, your keyboard and your mouse themselves have to communicate with your PC and sending that information and processing it has a certain amount of latency. Then it reaches the game um, where the CPU uh, has, to, has to deal with a whole bunch of stuff. There's some game latency involved here. And then finally it gets uh, you know, submitted to the render queue. The render queue itself has, has latency involved in it. And then it gets sent out to your display, which then has its own latency. Your monitor itself has some latency uh, for both processing and then the pixel response. So there's a lot to do with latency. And um, you know, frame generation adds additional latency as it delays one of the frames in the render queue basically to interpolate a frame. So that's what's going on there, right? Anyway, I thought this was a really interesting um, video though, if you wanna take a closer look at this. And I think it's a, it's a very good point that latency being used as a metric in GPU review discussions is probably a good idea. Now, I don't have the kind of hardware tools, the LDAT sensor that you would use to measure click to photon latency. But when I uh, show frame generation in my videos, I do try to at least use um, NVIDIA's overlay, which shows the PC latency. So it doesn't include the peripheral latency and the display latency, uh, but you can uh, actually uh, insert little flags that allow a software monitor to monitor this amount of latency. I'm not sure if it includes the game latency or just the render latency. I think it's the full, the full software stack. So at least software monitors that. And then um, you can then look at if you're using frame generation on versus frame generation off, you can measure the difference in the PC latency, which isn't showing you the full latency because it doesn't measure the peripherals, uh, you know, and the display and things like that, but it does at least show the differential in, re in, in rendering latency introduced by frame generation. And so you can at least start to attach certain numbers to certain, you know, feelings if, if you do monitor that. I don't know, it's, it's just, GPU reviews are getting really complicated <laughs> these days, guys. Um, all of these new technologies with upscaling and now frame generation, and now we've got driver level frame generation, they're all really interesting to talk about uh, and to review, but they certainly make the review process more complicated, especially because they're also not apples to apples comparisons. Um, man, GPU reviews are getting really interesting. I might need to do a dedicated video coming up just with my overall thoughts on just GPU reviews, just the state they're in right now. Cause it's really interesting. Cause any review you do, you always get people talking in the comments about like, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, this is biased, your choice of game, how you're doing this. You chose to test this and not that, the settings that you're using, all of that. And I mean, they're not wrong that there is a lot of subjectivity 
in the choices that you make when you do a GPU review and then your final conclusions you make at the end. But like, um, it's getting harder and harder to try to stick to just uh, exactly apples to apples comparisons because that starts to deviate from how the GPUs are actually uh, used. And I feel like I'm drifting off, ta off topic for today's video, but maybe I've got enough thoughts to do a dedicated video in the future. Do you guys want my thoughts on just the whole GPU review process <laughs> and how much bias and subject subjectivity is, is in it, but that that's actually kind of necessary to test the technologies that are available that people actually use? Anyway, there's a lot going on here. But uh, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that if you've got a cable mod GPU adapter uh, for your, um, uh, you know, 12VH, whatever the heck it is, very high power, is that what it is? Anyway, if you have one of these angled power adapters uh, uh, from cable mod, they are causing problems. Apparently they've caused $74,000 in property damage and a recall has been issued. So this is continuing the saga of that power connector in particular. Like I know apparently it's, you know, user error if it's not inserted perfectly and all of that. But guys, if you've designed a connector that makes itself more susceptible to user error, and feeds a lot more power through a small connection, you know, maybe it's not the best connection, even if, you know, but whatever. Anyway, just letting you guys know, the saga isn't over, and now specifically cable mods angled adapters seem to be uh, issuing a recall here. So uh, be aware. Now, uh, in other news that probably hasn't hit a lot of you guys, but uh, I'll throw into this section of, hey, be aware about uh, an issue with the product. Um, a mini PC maker, uh, it looks like Ace Magic, has um, apparently shipped some mini PCs where the Windows install itself contained spyware. Now, it doesn't seem to be every mini PC that they shipped, but certain batches of it. Uh, I'm seeing this report from tomshardware.com, but apparently the actual uh, information was noticed by the NetGuy Reviews YouTube channel, uh, where he found the issue in an Ace Magic AD108 mini PC that he received for review. And other models uh, like the AD15 and S1 also reportedly had similar problems. But again, apparently not every, uh, every, uh, every mini PC of that model had the issue. And according to the company, um, only certain batches had this issue. Now it's possible because it seemed like there was also evidence that it might not have been a legitimate copy of a Windows install. So I'm wondering if they used a, um, if they used like a, uh, maybe a bad, uh, you know, uh, fake Windows install that came with malware or something like that. I don't know all the details, but if you bought one of those PCs, you might want to look into whether it is logging your information. Um, now, in other news uh, of a, uh, not exactly a scam, but uh, <laughs> so um, Hardware Unboxed has pointed out in the review of AMD's 5700 non-X Ryzen CPU, and you might be like, wait, there's a Ryzen 5700 non-X? Yes, so AMD launched a bunch of CPUs recently, and one of them was the 5700 non-X. Now, technically this had been available in pre-built systems previously, but has now been introduced to the DIY market. Now, what Hardware Unbox is pointing out in, in this video is that the naming scheme is misleading compared to AMD's traditional uh, naming scheme of the non-X versus X chips. Generally, the only difference is a small clock speed difference. So you're functionally getting the same performance or at least basically the same performance at a lower price when you buy the non-X version. However, the, in this particular version, it's actually a 5700G that has the integrated graphics disabled rather than a 5700X that has been downclocked, which means that you, you have more significant problems because some people are, are, are or are not aware that the G series products actually to make room for that integrated graphics make other sacrifices to the hardware, including most importantly for gaming performance, reduced cache size. Games scale a lot, at least many games do, 
with the ca available cache size, that's what makes AMD's own X3D chips so good. They stack the V cache, the 3D V cache gets more cache, games love it, and it gives them like the best gaming performance on the market. But if you reduce cache size, you lose gaming performance. And that's what we're seeing in this video. The 5700 non-X has, has significantly cut down cache size compared to the X version. And that is uh, making it significantly worse at gaming compared to what you would expect from the naming scheme. So just be aware of that. And you could follow my link in the video description to the Hardware Unboxed review if you wanna see their full uh, you know, gaming performance testing. But I thought I'd bring this to your attention if you were considering this chip. Uh, which you might, because if you're on the AM4 platform, you might be looking for an upgrade from like a 2000 series Ryzen or something like that. Now, speaking of other slightly misleading things from AMD CPUs recently, uh, AMD's 8000G APUs, um, which are for one thing confusing just because of the 8000 series not actually being a new generation of hardware, it's just a new year, so they've updated the number to an eight instead of a seven. So it's more like the 7000 series, but it's actually worse at gaming than the 7000 series chips because of the G, the G being adding in the integrated graphics. Anyway, I've talked about this in other videos, and again, adding in the integrated graphics requires other cutbacks, as I just mentioned when discussing the 5700, so I'm not gonna get back into it. However, when they were initially listed, they were listed as supporting ECC RAM on AMD's website. However, um, that is now not the case. AMD has confirmed they do not support ECC RAM. So if you were hoping they did or were that was something that mattered to you for a purchasing decision, which I don't think it is for the vast majority of people, just be aware, actually no, despite what had been uh, initially listed. Now, in other interesting news, apparently resizable bar is being modded in for older PCs that would not normally support resizable bar. Uh, this uh, PC Gamer article saying that it can deliver up to 12% more performance and uh, could uh, uh, work on systems as old as Sandy Bridge. Now this is interesting. Um, so first of all, up to means up to, it doesn't mean average. So your average performance uplift from resizable bar is significantly less, but there are certain games that can greatly benefit from it. Some actually lose performance. You have to be a little bit careful. Uh, anyway, the, the thing is resizable bar is generally only supported on the last few generations of CPUs and motherboards, but apparently this mod is now, um, uh, a project titled Rebar UEFI by GitHub user Xcurio uh, is um, apparently enabling this technology. Now, this can be a bit complicated. I'm not gonna get into the full details of how you do this, and I have not tested it out myself. I just wanted to, in this news video, bring it to your attention that apparently this is a thing. So if you're interested in tinkering around with stuff on an older system, this might be something you could have fun playing around with, but just be uh, you know aware that modding stuff not officially you know this is not officially supported. Uh, you know all of the general caveats apply there. Now speaking of mods in general, that's just one of the coolest things about the PC space. Like a lot of times I see people pushing back on um, PC pricing right now, which I totally get compared to consoles where it's like man, you can get a pretty good gaming experience with the PS5 for a lot less money than an equivalent gaming PC, uh, or even a Series S isn't a bad gaming experience for under $300, right? Uh, so yeah, certainly consoles have a lot going for, for them from a, you know, optimized for, you know, uh, you know, just, just uh, a certain, certain aspect of it, right? But the PC gaming space has mods, right? <laughs> and uh, I just thought I'd highlight that and celebrate the fact that apparently Nexus Mods has now crossed the 10 billion downloads milestone. So let's just celebrate for a minute how cool the modding scene is on PC and what a, uh, you know, uh, how, how awesome of a feature that is of this platform. So, so yes, consoles have things going for them too, but don't act like PC is just a gaming console, they're different things. So maybe you lose some performance per dollar at certain price points, but you do get some pretty cool stuff out of it. Now, um, speaking of mods, uh, NVIDIA has recently released the open beta for RTX Remix, 
which uh, should allow for some really cool mods of older games, adding in other assets as well as path tracing and ray tracing and DLSS features and things like that. Uh, it has been, but there's compatibility issues, right? It's only compatible with certain games. I've talked about this in other videos. It is being updated to 0.4.1, which is apparently improving compatibility uh, in a number of ways. There's a bunch of patch notes here, but again, rather than dive into the full details, I'll just mention this here. Uh, so if you're interested in this, um, take a look at the link in the video description. Now, um, I probably just uh, flashbanged you again with a white background, apologies. Uh, NVIDIA has launched a hotfix driver to apparently assist with some stuttering issues. So some users may experiment uh, intermittent micro stuttering in games when VSync is enabled. Apparently this resolves that along with potential stutter in, while scrolling in web browsers on cer certain system configurations. Some stutter in the Vulkan version of Red Dead Redemption 2 on certain Optimus notebooks and some stability issues in Immortals of Avium. In general, if you're experiencing those issues, maybe take a look at this hotfix driver. Now, speaking of NVIDIA, ASRock was speaking about NVIDIA recently. So ASRock makes Intel and AMD GPUs. Now, a representative from ASRock was um, interviewed by Quasar Zone. I'm seeing a videocards.com article quoting this. And Quasar Zone, and this is a translation, was asking them, what are your plans for the future product lineup? Are there any plans to support NVIDIA graphics cards? Now, ASRox has, has been a bit late in, in kind of joining the, the, the um, you know, add in card uh, scene. But again, they've joined for AMD and Intel. So why not NVIDIA? Well, they said, this is quite a challenging question. Companies that have both NVIDIA and AMD are Asus, Gigabyte, and MSI. These brands have been in operation for a long uh, longer time than us. And back when they were founded, there, there were not only ATI and NVIDIA, but there were also chipset manufacturers like Elsa and Voodoo. And no one had a monopolistic position at that time. However, as time passed, NVIDIA's market dominance became overwhelming and a world where the production of, uh, uh, of NVIDIA VGA became influential emerged. I believe there are complex reasons for this. From the perspective of ASRock, currently producing AMD and Intel VGA, it seems challenging for us to immediately start manufacturing NVIDIA. Now, it's, it's not directly stated here, but th th you could kind of read this to imply that there is some kind of difficulty working with NVIDIA here, whether that's because they're working with AMD and Intel or whether it's just because of NVIDIA's monopolistic position. I mean, just their market share is massive um, compared to Intel and AMD in the GPU space that somehow that there's some sort of difficulty there or barrier uh, with, but, but it's not explicitly stated exactly what that is. But they're also not ruling out working with them in the future. I just find this interesting, especially in the context of uh, you know a couple years ago now, right? A couple years ago, anyway. EVGA, who was one of Nvidia's you know biggest board partners, just leaving that all behind and shutting it down. So um, I don't know. I'm just curious what it's like to be a board partner for Nvidia's GPUs. I'm curious what's going on there, and this is just more kind of evidence that maybe not all is easy and well there for Nvidia's board partners, but that is kind of speculation just based on what this is saying here. Anyway. Speaking of NVIDIA, apparently they are forming a new business unit focused on custom chip development. Now, that could be for a lot of things, including AI, game consoles, auto, and more. Anywhere you would want a custom designed chip. Now, what's interesting to me here is the game consoles. Now, we do know that NVIDIA does partner with, uh, with um, Nintendo uh, for their game consoles. Uh, but not, you know, the big, bigger uh, consoles like Xbox and PlayStation, not saying bigger in sales. I mean, Ninten and Nintendo sells huge numbers. But um, anyway, uh, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that the next generation of consoles are, uh, you know, from PlayStation or Xbox are at all considering NVIDIA. In fact, the contrary being it seems uh, very well uh, documented, at least in the rumor space, that um, they're considering a continuing with AMD. But I'm curious if there's any interest in eventually, um, you know, taking a look at that. I don't know. Or maybe they're just talking about um, uh, continuing to work with, with Nintendo, that kind of thing. But anyway, and there's, there's other stuff going on there as well. I just thought that was an interesting headline. Now, um, in other news, this is more monitor related. I think this is going to be the year of 
uh, OLEDs. Like, I know we've already had OLEDs, but if you looked at the announcement for new monitors, the OLED lineups are massively expanding. And with that being the case, you know, people continue to have a concern about burn-in. It is still true that OLEDs, well, they are getting better. And like, I use a lot of OLEDs and I don't have issues with this. Uh, burn-in is still more likely or more of a thing to consider when purchasing an OLED monitor compared to other technologies. So it's interesting here that we're seeing TFT Central tweeting that Asus have updated their warranties for all their OLED monitors um, to now include a two-year burn-in coverage, which should at least hopefully uh, alleviate some concerns if you're considering making the jump to OLED. Of course, still two years. What if you have problems in three? Well, in three years, MSI has you covered. <laughs> uh, so MSI is announcing a three-year burn-in warranty for their OLED monitors, uh, which is nice. So anyway, uh, it's just definitely something to consider when you're buying an OLED monitor. And so uh, seeing uh, monitor companies try to stand behind their OLED monitors with longer warranties is only a good thing. And I would love to see three years or more uh, become standard on that. Although, you know, we'll have to see what happens. Hey, let's talk about some GPU coolers. I know a lot of people are interested in white builds and this Power Color Spectral White Hellhound 7900 XT looks like it could be a very good look for an all white build because not every white GPU, uh, not every white GPU cooler also has a white PCB. We can see the PCB itself is also white in these photos here. Uh, so that's a pretty cool look. So if you are interested in a all white build, um, maybe take a look at the Hellhound uh, Spectral uh, 7900 XT. Uh, another interesting GPU cooler I noticed here is the RTX 4080 Super Valkyrie um, from Zephyr. Now, apparently this comes with a 280 millimeter AIO cooler. So basically this would be uh, like a, a water block going into an AIO radiator um, on that one. I don't know as much about um, uh, this product and if it's gonna be uh, on sale worldwide, but that does uh, look like it's, again, providing another interesting option. Now let's get into more of some uh, PC game news side of things. Although looking at the time on the video, I'll make this pretty quick. Uh, so Ubisoft is uh, has made their skull and bones kind of available to play open beta kind of thing. Uh, but it's getting some mixed feedback <laughs> and uh, it's also gonna launch at a $70 price point. They're getting some pushback against that. Ubisoft CEO trying to defend it as saying, this is a quadruple A game. So apparently we're moving into the realm of 4A games and only Skull and Bones qualifies. Except a lot of people are saying it's maybe not that interesting. Are you guys enjoying it? I don't know. I think a quadruple A game might have actually had the single player content the game was originally designed and announced to have, which they've cut to focus on the games as a service stuff. Speaking of games as a service launches, uh, Helldivers 2, is launching very strongly on Steam. It is uh, PlayStation's top Steam launch. Now, user reviews are a bit mixed though. I've looked into this, I haven't played the game myself. So the Steam charts right now are up to an all-time peak right now of over 90,000 concurrent players, which is quite a high number and is a top number for, uh, um, uh, for a PlayStation title. However, you can see the Steam ratings are a bit mixed, more positive than negative for sure. It's looking like um, when you look at uh, review information on this, we're seeing a, a, a rough launch due to some instability issues, people getting dropped from matches and things like that. Uh, but as of eight hours ago, PC Gamer published an article saying that it is getting into much better shape than it was at the initial few hours of launch. So I'm wondering if some of those negative uh, reviews are talking about those kind of performance issues and stability issues, server issues that are maybe getting ironed out. But it's sounding like a lot of people are enjoying it because high, con high concurrent player uh, peak number there, which is interesting. Now, um, uh, uh, let's see, in other news, I am seeing... Um, I was gonna get into this. I don't know how much I wanna get into this. So Outriders has been out for a while. It's been out since 2021. I, this is kind of speaking of Steam reviews. So Steam reviews have some interesting features. One of them is uh, pre-release reviews 
get factored into the review system slightly differently than reviews from after release. Now, normally that would be for an early access game, right? Well, Outriders was not an early access game, but we're seeing a Steam, uh, sorry, a Reddit post here highlighting the fact that when the game got released as a complete edition, its Steam reviews from prior to the complete edition were tagged as pre-release. Now, it's unclear if this was just a uh, a unplanned kind of consequence of how the game was updated to the complete edition, or uh, whether this was done intentionally, but it certainly changed the review metrics. And apparently this is not the only game where people have noticed this happen, but it hasn't been common. Also, this made the game move to the new games list on Steam, potentially boosting its, its visibility in the Steam marketplace. So I'm wondering if this is intentionally gaming the system or just a weird consequence to how the game was updated. But either way, kind of interesting thing to keep an eye on in Steam's system. But I think that's enough for today's video. I hope you guys found it useful and or interesting. And a huge thank you to viewers, commenters, subscribers, and especially comment, uh, sorry, uh, channel members who have clicked the join button to directly support the channel financially. I know not everybody's in a place to do that, uh, but huge thank you to everybody who is and no hard feelings on anybody who isn't. Uh, you are all beautiful people and I hope you have an excellent day.